Thank you very much, and thanks for this uh, extraordinary introduction. It's pretty difficult to live up to this kind of thing, and um, I will try my best. Um, this, incidentally, this uh, lecture was advertised as something by a renowned French anthropologist, uh, Pascal Boyer. I don't know if I'm renowned, but I know that I'm American. Um, and uh, as American as apple pie, although this particular pie is of recent baking, but I'm very happy <laughs> of it anyway. And since I spend most of my life in Britain, it's, um, it's not terribly French, what I'm going to say. And, and I want to emphasize that because just in case uh, some people here were expecting some uh, Foucauldian postmodernist uh, musings on creativity and culture, this talk might be uh, slightly disappointing, if not uh, altogether offensive. So. Um, I want to approach these things not in terms of individual creativity, what makes some people exceptional, but in terms of uh, biological human evolution. You know, how did we get to the point that we have millions of people creating lots of cultural products all the time? And how is that possible in a species whose uh, makeup was constrained by natural selection? Um, the way I want to explain this is, uh, or what I want to uh, say about it today, is that in general, when we approach these things in um, anthropology or in the study of human evolution, we tend to have this idea um, that there is a sort of liberation event in the evolution of uh, mankind from you know, other apes that m seems that the mind sort of broke free of its chain, of its shackles and human behavior became, and sort of hominin behavior became human, cultural. Uh, imagination and creativity are seen as a kind of liberation. Uh, the problem is that this liberation theme is very bad evolutionary anthropology. Um, and the mind is not uh, something that God created out of a miraculous event and that made it very different from uh, what apes were doing with their cognitive systems. It's made of a great number of different systems that each do what they're supposed to do to given uh, their evolution by natural selection. Each of them has uh, an um, evolved function. And each of those systems, I will talk about some of them, carries the potential for uh, creative innovation. So in other words, what we have is liberation through adaptations. And I will try to substantiate this claim by talking about a few domains where this is in my view, uh, quite plausible or even uh, completely true. Um, I know this is a humanities talk, so I shouldn't use obscene words like that, but uh, I do stand by this story. Um, now, I put all the plot here in one slide because I know that, because I've worked in psychological labs, so I know that people's attention after two minutes tends to wander. Uh, so this is all there is to it, okay? Uh, the rest are pretty pictures. Uh, so, why do we have this liberation theology, so to speak? This is a bad pun, but the, the, or bad play on words, but we do have this idea that until, say, 200,000 years ago, or until, you know, up to 50,000 years ago, um, mental systems, even of hominins and homo erectus, were pretty different from what they are now or what they've been ever since. And we tend to think that there is one phenomenon that um, explains that, which is that there's a starting point of cogn cognitive evolution. So all the way up, um, up to that sort of cultural explosion that we see, um, depending on what you want to call the cultural explosion, it could be 200,000 years in Africa, or it could be 50,000 years yeah. in Europe, um, you have very high cognitive specialization of systems. Apes, apes brains, when Homo brains seem to have lots of different systems that do different things and that they're specialized in those things, but they don't seem to be doing much beyond that. In other words, the idea is that primitive pre-human humans were very good at foraging, they were very good at mating, they were very good at warfare, but they couldn't do much besides, think they couldn't think outside the box to, to, to put it in popular terms. And then, then a miracle occurs. Um, which could be the development of, natural, of general intelligence. Some people say, well, we used to have special intelligences. Then we got something much more abstract, which is general intelligence. 
and we have this outburst of cultural, cultural creativity. Now, and then we get this sort of uh, wonderful thing, which is from the Chauvet Cave, that's from 37,000 years ago. But how did the mind supposedly break free? Well, people have very um, complicated and often pretty vague answers to that, I think. Some of them, including, um, um, to some extent, Terry Deacon, who was speaking a while ago here, would say that symbolism is something that uh, made the mind very different from what it used to be. Um, people say, well, what we find at, say, 70 to 50,000 years ago is the sudden development of cultures that is the idea that each group has very different norms and ways of doing things. Uh, you probably know about the history of the Ashurian axe, which is a very, very nice axe that uh, um, humans made for about a million years without ever changing anything in it. Now, this sort of um, stability in human capacities changes all of a sudden, it seems, and humans start doing things that are just the local versions of uh, um, an artifact, for example. But the problem is that this is uh, largely vacuous. You know, what do we mean by culture such that it would have that power? And also, uh, this doesn't tell us about anything about what the mind change was uh, that supported the evolution of culture. Uh, some people say that it's modern natural language that did it. Um, that is, proto-languages of various kinds that we uh, know of do not allow non-referential use. I mean, in the sense that, you know, the kind of language that we uh, see in um, pigeons, for example, have great difficulty talking about anything else than the here and there. Um, but modern languages do it. Um, and complex syntax creates a common code for representations. That is, uh, language is something that allows you to talk about sensory information from all sorts of different modalities in a common idiom. Maybe it's the development of imagination, maybe it's the development of memory and time travel, by which I mean mental time travel, not literal physical time travel. Um, that's possible. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, humans are a bit special in the fact that they can be sensitive to what happened in the past and very sensitive to what might happen in the future. And it doesn't seem to be the same for uh, many other species. But again, the problem is that all this is way too vague. And it tells us that all we need is a magic bullet that will take us uh, from this fellow who seems to have a longing, you know, you can see it in his face, is trying to be something else. What is trying to be something else is this. Um, but no, this is bad anthropology. Uh, there is no teleology there. And this guy on the, on the left was never trying or even going towards being like this person. So we have to find something else that explains what happened that created, uh, that triggered cultural creativity. The problem with liber liberation scenarios is that very often the magic bullet is not sufficient. Uh, language is not sufficient for culture. Uh, in development, you find that lots of linguistic capacities predate um, people's capacity for imaginative uh, play. And so sometimes the magic bullet is very vague or vacuous. You know, uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't have said that if Terry Deacon was actually here, uh, but he's not here, so I can say, what on earth is symbolism? Um, or how did, you, how, did you, how did culture beget culture? I mean, you know, people say, well, we acquired cultures uh, when we were uh, at 50 or 70,000 years ago. Yeah, that's right, but the, the, the basic problem is that culture, cultures made us different. Yes, but how did they occur? Uh, but we have another problem when we, with those liberation scenarios, which is that uh, they have a problem of indirection. They don't tell us, they don't explain what we want to understand. What we want to understand is not just why there is human uh, culture or cultures. What we want to understand is why is it the way it is? Why are there cultural universals and quasi-universals, the things that you're very likely to encounter in lots of different cultures in the world? Why these particular recurrent themes? And I will try to explain what I mean by that, that we have this sort of um, elephant in the room, as it, as it were, in anthropology, which is that human cultures do have enormous things uh, in, in common that we want to explain and that we uh, very often are not explaining in uh, current anthropological frameworks.
So we want to explain all this. Now, uh, the alternative to uh, the idea of a um, sudden event or a magic bullet is that we are the same as other species. We have many instincts, and instincts in the modern sense, not in the old sense of some automatic process, but mental systems that are dedicated to some uh, adaptive problem. We have lots of those systems which are geared to solving adaptive problems like finding a mate, which is not a very uh, uh, easy thing to do if you don't have pre predisposition to uh, select certain objects uh, in the world as mates. So for, for foraging, which is a very complex uh, mathematical problem to solve, you know, how to extract maximum resources from patchy environments, how to do warfare, which, create, which requires lots of coordination between people, how to organize cooperation, which also requires very complex processes. Now, none of these issues is uh, solved by having lots of general intelligence. That is, um, the main specific problems like finding a mate or finding a, um, a better way of using your uh, patchy environment to to extract nutrients from it. These are very specific problems. If you try to apply, to apply the logic of foraging to mating, uh, you would be in dire straits very quickly because the mating environment is patchy, but not in the same way as the foraging environment. And also, uh, the patches of uh, nutrients in the environment do not resent it when you neglect them. But <laughs> I have news for you. If you apply foraging to mating, it's not going to work. So we have the main specific problems and we have the main specific principles that, um, that um, help us solve these recurrent problems. Which means that if we are a more complex species and we are more complicated cognitively than rabbits, rabbits are more complicated than cockroaches and cockroaches are more complicated than paramecia, that means that we don't have less instinct. That means that we have more instinct. And that's something that William James actually said. Uh, humans are human because they have more instinct than other uh, species. The Darwinian version of that is what these days people would call evolutionary psychology, which is that uh, we have an extremely complex evolved psychology whose richness in terms of evolved dispositions and preferences is such that we can acquire mass, vast amounts of information from the environment. In general, in um, evolution, you'll find that systems that acquire more information from the environment are the systems that have more information to start with. Um, that is why if you want to design a cockroach, that may not be sort of super difficult. But if you want to divine, design a rabbit, that's going to be much more challenging. And a naive is going to be more challenging and a human is going to be even more challenging because the operating system, so to speak, has to be vastly more complex to allow them to acquire vastly more information from the environment. Okay, so once you have this view of psychology, uh, does it mean that we have an evolved psychology that is a kind of iron cage uh, out of which we cannot think, well, I don't think so. And I want to demonstrate that it's precisely because we have this very rich psychology that we have cultural creativity. So I consider sort of three domains um, that of the stuff that makes us proud to be human. You know, when we uh, uh, consider ourselves, we say, well, after all, we have fiction, for example, uh, which is that we can think about worlds that do not actually exist, and we can be interested in people who do not exist. Um, also, something that should make us proud, in a way, is that we have nonsense ideologies. I will try to describe two of them and not be too offensive about the fact that they are kind of nonsensical. But uh, they demonstrate the fact that we can think nonsense shows how incredibly liberated we are. You know, because it's, uh, it seems to be that if, we, if our thought was strictly determined by what is around, we wouldn't have nonsense ideologies. Nonsense ideologies are proof of freedom, uh, as it were. And I will try to show that they also show the influence of evolved psychology. Finally, relig religious ideas, because you know, that's my uh, trade. Um, I, I, they, they seem to us that, uh, very often it seems to us that this is something that shows how unconstrained the human mind is because it creates uh, things that are beyond any empirical experience. And again, I want to say, well, yes, but it's because it is severely constrained by our evolved psychology that it can do that. So. 
let us look at fiction. And this is the portrait of someone engaging in fictive imagination. Um, since this is, I'm not teaching a class of undergraduates, I don't have to tell you that this is Marcel Proust, or I don't have to say that Marcel Proust was a famous writer uh, uh, of the beginning of the night. Uh, the, oh, sorry, I didn't show the picture. Oh, sorry, so there's no joke there. Uh, there is no there there, actually. Uh, anymore. Uh, I apologize for that. The fact is that my computer shows these pictures ahead of what you can see, uh, which is very misleading. So, um, so you have, an, for no extra money, a uh, rehearsal of, the, <laughs> of what I just said. Uh, right, okay. So this is him. And he's a, f a famous French writer uh, of the last century. Now, um, I won't talk about what creates people like Marcel Proust as opposed to people like Henry, um, Henry James. Uh, I will talk about something vastly more uh, mundane in a way, but also much more widespread, which is why on earth are humans interested in fiction? Why pay attention to the world of fiction in general. Uh, this is a universal interest. There is no place uh, on earth that anthropologists have described where uh, people do not create fictive worlds, um, stories, and pay attention to that. And they're interested. You know, it can be literate, highbrow literature of the kind we know, or folk tales and myths, and everyday sort of stuff uh, that people make up, stories, accounts. People are interested in those things. There are some quasi-universals of fiction that um, the Russian formalists, for example, were terribly interested in and that are not terribly sort of, well, literary studies don't seem to be interested in that anymore, but it's uh, an interesting topic. I mean, there are ways in which most fictive stories seem to obey certain rules. There are also recurrent themes, you know, the soap opera kind of nature of most, most uh, fiction in most societies most of the time is something that is difficult mm -hmm. to ignore. And ever since Aristotle, people have been trying to understand why is it that this is interesting. And if you're a, bio if you're a sort of biologically minded anthropologist, you'd say, why, what, what is in it for us? I mean, in what sense does that uh, participate in our fitness? So why should the interest for fiction be naturally selected? So we see that, for example, when we see this scene that this fellow is uh, reading, uh, we all empathize. Of course, it's vastly more interesting to read the book than to have sex with a woman uh, next to him. Of course it is. Uh, but empathizing is not enough. We have to explain why is that, that is so obviously more interesting. And for anthropologists, one thing that is clear about humans is that they have hypertrophied social intelligence. Uh, people can tell you that lots of primates have social intelligence, they have lots of social inferences, but humans have a sort of monstrous amount of social intelligence and interest in social interaction. For example, this is the kind of mental, uh, this is the kind of thing that humans have no difficulty in pausing. And if you were in that situation, you would understand that, of course, it's true that Bob realized that Luke can believe that Pat didn't know that Sid has forgotten to tell Jack that. That is the sort of thought that we have. And we don't find that very difficult. If you try to get any other primate to entertain that amount of levels of meta-representation, you'll see that it very soon collapses. We also have the capacity for trustworthiness evaluation. We, we, we trust others, but we know how not to trust them and how to measure how much they're reliable as partners. We do coalitional reasoning, that is, we know how to build alliances, we know how to fight against other alliances and things like that. This is a very deep sort of uh, domain of motivation for humans. We have very complex standards of fairness in our dealings with others. We depend enormously on social interaction, in, in, on social information, and that's why we have this, all these capacities. Um, People have said that, you know, if you want to understand what is the domain, the milieu in which humans live, their milieu is information, and it's information provided by others. Uh, the milieu of whales is the sea, while ours is information provided by other people. So that's why we have all these extremely sort of rich and sophisticated um, adaptations for social intelligence. 
Another sign of that is that we have an emotional interest in gossip. Again, a, there is no society in the world where people don't entertain gossip at the same time as saying that it's very bad, but also sort of uh, providing lots of news and things like that that way. So this um, is so important to us that it appears very, very early in development. I just want to give you a few sort of bench or yeah, landmarks of what, what this is. Um, 20 minutes old babies. Uh, imitate complex facial uh, uh, faces from adults. And when we say 20 minutes, it means um, that's, why because, that's because psychologists can only test them at 20 minutes. Because you know, before that, annoyingly, the parents want to handle the baby. Uh, so we can't get there and say, OK, it's just out. Let me sort of make faces and see how it imitates us. That's sort of, unfortunately, uh, unethical. Uh, at uh, two months, uh, children react to direct gaze as opposed to indirect gaze. Uh, that is, if you uh, look them in the eyes, uh, they follow gaze um, and so on and so forth. They start babbling. Um, turn taking, for example, appears very, very early in people who are five months, uh, six months old, and therefore do not talk, but they do, do take turns. And they structure their, inter interchange, their, their exchange with people in terms of turn taking. Then you have things like imperative and declarative uh, pointing, which means that children know how to attract the attention of others and focus it by using this gesture. This is something that appears spontaneously around that age. Other things appear later, like uh, pretend play, like an explicit desire-based theory of mind. Theory of mind is the term we use in the train to, trade to, to describe all those inferences that people have in their mind about the way minds work, so that, such that they can understand other people. Uh, people start having imaginary companions. They start understanding false beliefs in a way that is explicit, and so on and so forth. I spare you the details. Um, the pretense capacity is something that arises that, that, that arise pretty early. Uh, you know, like um, a banana as a phone or a soap bar as a car. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, when, you, when you do pretense, it seems like it's pretty easy to, um, it's pretty easy to do that, okay? To pretend that banana is a telephone. Um, however, it's very difficult. And one thing that's very difficult about it is that you have to keep two distinct representations of the same object distinct so that you don't mix them. So if you think, for example, if you do the reverse and pretend that the telephone handle, you know, for the young people, this is the way telephones used to look like. Um, some of you may not have seen these things, but that's, uh, okay. If you treat a telephone like a banana and you say, oh, I've got a banana, I've got a banana, you have to remember not to start munching it because it's actually a telephone. So imagine in a two-year-old's brain, you have to have this sort of constant interplay with these uh, two sets of, sets of representations without mixing the inferences you can draw from them. This is pretty important. And this is also why some people don't manage it. Uh, some patients don't manage it, and some uh, species seem to be pretty bad at it. But to sum up, what we have is we have an intuitive psychology, that is an intuitive understanding of what it is that a mind is such that other people have it. And it's const it is constantly activated. It's mostly tacit and automatic. I cannot act in front of you without you having a mentalistic representation of what are the thoughts and desires that make me act. But also, it has this, these... Um, it results in a certain theory of what people are like, a theory that is tacit, that we'd never make explicit, but that is directing our social interaction. For example, and this is, this is something that appears very early in young children, young children think that mental, mental states are invisible, but they're real, and also that they're non-physical. So that it's possible, and some developmental psychologists have shown that uh, for three-year-olds, there's absolutely no difficulty in thinking that the thought of an apple is not juicy, it's not this size, it's not you know about uh, three ounces in weight and stuff like that, because a thought is a thing that is non-physical. But also, children and we too think that non-physical things have a physical effect because they drive behavior. Um, 
when I was doing fieldwork, anthropological fieldwork in Cameroon, I sometimes asked people uh, those questions about thoughts, and they said, yeah, of course, thoughts are somewhere in the head or the heart, but they, they, they're not the real thing, and they're not physical, and so on and so forth. But how come the desire, for example, to lift your arm results in you lifting your arm? And they thought the question was perfectly stupid. And everyone in the world thinks that question is really baffling and slightly uh, stupid, except philosophers who are trained into finding these things weird, but our how spontaneous evolved intuition is that, yes, there are non-physical things inside our heads that have physical effects on our bodies. That's the axiom. That's not something you have to demonstrate. But also, uh, we have intuitive assumptions that start when we're young, but we also have them in a purely tacit way, we're not aware of them, that, for example, persons are continuous, that there's a certain identity of mind, uh, such that what I told you yesterday is still somewhere in your mind, but it's not in the minds of other people, unless you told them. Um, but also that there are stable preferences and capacities. If I see uh, today that you prefer um, A to B, uh, I kind of infer, I assume that you will prefer A to B, all else being equal uh, tomorrow, because you'll still be the same person. Also, we have an assumption of mental coherence, uh, which is that we have, a we have strong causal um, principles about how minds work. We think, for example, that perception, we think, we never think about that explicitly, but we assume that perception causes beliefs, uh, which cause desires, which cause intention, which cause action. And whenever we see evidence of the arrows going another, the other way, uh, we find that deeply pathological. So that if someone has a, has a belief that creates a perception, we think that's not normal. Okay, the, the mind is not working the same way. If someone tells you, I really like bananas so much that I see them, you think that person has a problem. Okay, all else being equal again. We also assume that there's great consistency in beliefs and desires. That is, even though it's not always the case, actually, we assume that people, um, if they desire X, and they know that you cannot have X unless you do Y, will try to do Y. Okay, we expect that. So there's a whole lot of expectations like that that are not um, conscious and that are driving our interaction all the time. This system is constantly activated whenever we interact with people. But the thing is that this, this system uh, creates huge constraints on what fiction is possible. Um, like, for example, it makes the notion of a character, which is a stable, person-like uh, agent with uh, roughly stable preferences from one moment to the next, and a history of um, causation, that is, the memories in this person are caused by actual experiences and so on. Um, that is something that we find in most societies in the world. People do not engage in fiction where um, the characters, that is the agents, suddenly change preferences or change roles or change identities. It's crucial to maintain that. And why is that the, the case? But because it's the, very, it's the simplest way of telling a story, which is to assume, take for granted, and transfer all the assumptions you have about intuitive psychology, sorry, from intuitive psychology, all the tacit intuitions you have about the way mental systems work, you just transfer them to that fictive world unless you have some information to the contrary. That is, violations of intuitive psychology, when they uh, appear in fiction, must be uh, flagged. So, for example, if you have a story, how uh, weird that would seem, about um, a hero who uh, only does what she doesn't want to, to, to do, uh, then you have to say it, because no one will infer that from the narrative. On the other hand, if you have a character who does what they want in order to bring about what they prefer, you don't have to say it because readers will, or listeners will automatically transfer that. Also, the notions of plotline and causation in fiction um, are uh, pretty constraining, and they're taken from um, intuitive psychology. There's, there are plots that are natural and plots that are unnatural. And what I mean by that is the plots that are natural are the ones that are culturally successful because people have absolutely no problem following them and understanding what is going on. Um, also the stability of preferences, the desired behavior consistency. 
Here I must say that people will tell me, no, 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 that's not the case because there's lots of modernist literature that doesn't do that at all. Um, and uh, there's an ironic piece by uh, Jorge Luis Borges uh, that talks about that, where uh, Borges ironically, well, Borges ironically, of course, uh, uh, piling up layers of irony upon layers of irony, says that um, literature used to be good, like uh, the 1001 Nights. This is good literature. There's a plot. It makes sense. The, each of the stories had to, has to be consistent. The heroes have to do exactly what they need to do given their situation. Everything works. And then you have the Russian novels where people kill because they love or they leave someone because they want to be with them or things like that. And Borges says, well, that's cheap because that's just a way if you have no idea what to do with your plot to make it work anyway. Okay, but that's Borges. But what I have to say about modernism, it's true that when you uh, read Ulysses, uh, uh, you have uh, a counterexample to everything I said here. Uh, but that's why there's only one of Ulysses, and that's why it has so few readers, and why so many of the readers are frustrated, and so on and so forth. Okay. But all this is fine, but it, it tells us, okay, so you have an evolved mind with its social intelligence and it makes your fiction of a certain kind, but it still hasn't explained. Why do people pay attention? Why would they want to buy these things? Why would they want to, why do they have pleasure in listening to the stories? So what about the motivation? Well then, at this point, most evolutionary uh, anthropologists or psychologists would have two kinds of hypotheses. And it's very difficult to say which one uh, supports, is supported by more of the evidence. Excuse me. One is the byproduct hypothesis, which is that we have adaptations, we have dispositions. Like, for example, if, we are, if you are a frog or if I am a frog, we, we, we need to feed on insects. So we have a disposition to attend to anything that looks like uh, insects, like all fast-moving small objects. Now, as it happens, we have a social mind and social dispositions. We need to pay attention to social interaction. That's a vital need for our survival, okay? Um, whoever in our ancestors um, did not pay much attention to social interaction is not among our ancestors, okay? We are the descendants of the people who did pay attention. Um, and also, we are rewarded for paying attention. That's why gossip is pleasurable. It's an evolved sort of trait. Gossip is pleasurable because if we didn't have pleasure in exchanging information about sex, power, and status, and things like that among other people, we would have a much poorer view of our social world. You know, it's like, you know, why do we find sugar rewarding? Well, because it's uh, something that we need, at least in the environments where we evolved. So we're rewarded for this sort of sugar of the mind that is social stuff. Um, so the idea is that uh, fiction mimics um, the features of social interactions. Plots have the feature of real social interactions. You know, he wanted this, she wanted that. He enlisted the help of someone else. She, you know, ran away. He, you know, this sounds like real social interaction. So the idea is that our minds are tricked. This is a bit like a, oh, I'm sorry, man. How about these things? Um, our minds are tricked, and it's just a byproduct. So the idea is that uh, some people have said that fiction is candy for the mind, for the social mind, and that's very much the idea. That in the same way as you know, we used to have a, a real need to gorge ourselves with fat and sugar uh, when we encountered it in ancestral environments because those things were rare, but now we have cake shops, so those things are kind of disastrous. But at the same time, cakes are wonderful, they're delicious. Um, and the idea is that fiction is candy for the mind. That's the byproduct idea. So there is no intrinsic um, fitness advantage in being interested in fiction. It just happens that our minds are tricked by that. The problem about that is that it has some limitations. Um, one problem is that we invest too much energy and effort in getting fiction. We have too much reward for it to be a perfectly neutral thing. It's a very expensive thing to do. Uh, we spend time that we could spend doing other things, listening to stories about characters, you know, people who do not exist. Uh, so maybe there's too much investment. There may be something that we get out of that. So some people are saying, well, it is a form of training, maybe, and that's why we're uh, disposed to love it. 
Oh, I'm sorry. This is. If we have a training hypothesis, what we're saying is that um, this is very much like play. I mean, anyone who's seen human babies can tell you that they keep going at it like this, like they're in a gym. And actually, they are in a gym. They have to build muscle. And the only way to build muscle is to go on like this, you know, 24 7, at least, I mean, two hours out of 24, and sleep the rest of the time. But uh, that's what you're doing. And it is pleasurable in the same way as play is pleasurable for all mammals, and we are no exception. We love to play, and we play at things like chasing um, and so on and so forth, which are a form of training. We train ourselves constantly by investing tens of thousands of hours doing something for the pure fun of doing it. Something that tells us that maybe the training hypothesis is um, onto something is that, uh, as you know, lots of children have imaginary companions imaginary friends, and that used to be thought of as a kind of pathology that, you know, uh, it's, you know, my child has an imaginary friend, I would much rather she had a real friend, um, so what's wrong with her? Well, actually, developmental psychologists, and especially um, Marjorie Taylor, who studied this phenomenon, uh, showed that children who have imaginary companions, because not all, not all of them uh, do it, uh, children who have imaginary companions are actually much better uh, earlier than other kids at solving social intelligence problems, social interaction problems. In other words, they get training from interacting with someone who's not around, okay? And it's confirmed also by the fact that um, imaginary companions are not pure fantasies that always obey what you want. Indeed, most kids who have imaginary companions say that it's pretty tough because the imaginary friend does not want to cross the road with you. So you have to convince them. Okay, they don't want to go have ice cream with you. You have to tell them why. To. So it could be it could be that fiction represents some form of training in social interaction, which is very good news for the humanities and humanities department because it predicts two things. Uh, well, because of two things. One is, is that it predicts that people who've read more fiction and especially more of the complicated kind will be better at social intelligence, and I think that's true. I don't have the scientific evidence, but I think that's true. More cultured people are actually better understanding uh, social interaction simply because they've seen a lot of it, much more than they have through their lives. They've seen lots of it in Jane Austen, and that is very good training for them. So we need humanities department to train people into in, uh, social intelligence. So we've rescued the humanities, that's one thing. Um, this is Calvin and Hobbes, as mm, you may know. It, it's a story about him in a manager and companion. So let's move on to some other domains where we, we see this kind of um, creativity out of constrained minds, by, uh, constrained by evolution. And I'll talk about nonsense ideologies for uh, two minutes just because uh, it's getting late, so I need to offend people so people don't you know, fall asleep. So I'll talk about some of these things that... Uh, people might think of as not as nonsense ideologies. So homeopathy is a perfect example of something that is culturally successful uh, partly because of the kinds of minds we all uh, have by virtue of evolution. And I'll tell you why. The story, uh, as you know, of um, homeopathy is that the initial theory by Hahnemann uh, was based on two, um, two tenets, as it were. One is that uh, same has an effect on same, that is something that, that um, uh, triggers fevers uh, will be relevant for fevers, but also of dilution, so that if you dilute things uh, billions and billions of times, then you have the reverse effect, so that you can cure fevers by quinine when it's diluted, and you dilute those things a great number of times. Okay. So, of course, chemists say when you've diluted something to that extent, you don't have the something in the thing. Okay, yeah, that's, that's it. But why does that spread? I'm not here to say whether it's uh, true, untrue, or whatever, but why does it spread? Well, it seems to me, I mean, first of all, it did spread because it's a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, there's that you know, well-known $20 million duck uh, that is used. One of the homeopathic medicines is an extract of duck liver. But it's so diluted 
you know, 100 billion, 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 billion times that in order to produce the entire production in the United States, which last year uh, made $20 million, all you would need is one duck and one liver. So that's what people call it, the $20 million duck. You know, if you get that duck, you have this thing. Okay. So why does that spread? Well, we happen to have something in our evolved psychology that is present in lots of different ways in different cultures that is about something almost like homeopathy. We have theories and intuitions about contagion. Now, there are very different cultural theories about uh, contagion and pathogens. In some places, like in China, people would tell you that you shouldn't breathe near a sick person because they uh, exhale bad air. Um, there is a theory of miasma in some cultures. We, are ha of course, have the, bio, uh, the Western biomedical theory about microbes. Uh, where I did field work, people had a theory about invisible darts that are sent by sick people and that penetrate uh, inside the, the, the veins and the arteries and make the, your blood very thick. Okay, you can have all sorts of theories like that, but there are common intuitions behind those theories. The, the intuition that illness is transmissible as opposed to accident, uh, uh, an intuition that contact is dangerous, and then nutrition that there's no way to detect the real state, oops, the real state of the organism. Now, why do we have those intuitions? It happens that we are humans and like rats, we are food generalists. Uh, we eat more or less all the nutrients that we can find in our environments and this has several consequences. One of them is that we eat lots of natural vegetables, which is the worst, one of the worst things you could do because natural vegetables are very bad for you uh, because they're full of toxins. They have toxins because they have to repel uh, um, predators like insects. Uh, we also eat uh, meats, which being you know, a very natural thing are very bad for you uh, because they're full of bacteria. So we have to have systems that direct us to behavior that takes that into account. we have to detect the pathogenic danger. And sometimes we have direct reactions that do that work, like gut reactions, you know, disgust. So if you see this thing, I hope you can see it in all its festering glory. Uh, if you see this thing on the side of the road, you don't think, wow, free lunch, you know, I'll just take it home. <laughs> you leave it there. And rats and humans are very good at learning that kind of thing. Oh, sorry, these things. We have these um, intuitions that, uh, sorry, we have this system that tells us uh, that something is disgusting, but also we have a very good learning system. For example, we can learn disgust, like rats do, actually, uh, from other people. And from seeing someone vomit after they ate some of this uh, pork, uh, you can acquire a gut reaction of your own. So this is a learning system that, you know, you get information from others. Now, there are three intuitive, ooh, yeah, it doesn't matter. There are three intuitive principles that we have. One is that the vector of bad stuff, like diseases, is invisible. The second one is that there's multiple channels of transmission, so any form of contact is bad. And the third one is that the dose doesn't matter, uh, by which, uh, I will try to illustrate that, but um, what I mean by that is that if I tell you that I put a little bit of uh, pepper in the stew, and you hate pepper, um, black pepper, you'll, t I, I, you'll say, oh, God, that's, that's, that's pity because I really hate that. And if I say, well, but it's only a you know, tiny, tiny, tiny amount, you'll say, okay, that's all right. But imagine I say it's poop that I put in the stew, and you say, well, you know what, or vomit, and you say, ah, oh, you know what, I don't like that stuff in my stew, and I say, no, but you know, it's only a half spoonful, it's not that much, I'm sure you'd say, no, 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 it doesn't work. So we have intuitive constraints on this system. Paul Rosin, who's a psychologist at Penn, uh, who fam is famous for doing all sorts of weird experiments with people, one of which is to ask them to either wear, uh, put on a sweater that uh, used to be Hitler's sweater, and people in general do not want to do it. They 
thing. There's something contagious about Hitler's sweater, and they really don't want to wear it. If they're told that it's a sweater that was knitted by the same person who knitted Hitler's sweater, then it's, but they're still not good. Um, if you ask them to um, drink from a glass that's got a cockroach in it, um, if it's a real, real cockroach, they really don't want it. If it's a plastic cockroach, they still are not, you know, very really tempted. If it's a glass where they used to be a cockroach, they're still sort of reluctant. So you have all those magical transmission effects. But all these make sense. And the homeopathic claims are a bit like that too. You know, there's a counterintuitive claim in homeopathy, which is that the same does the opposite. So that's what attracts your attention. You know, in order to make you recover from this snake bite, we'll have to give you some of the snake. And that seems like there's some difficulty there. So it's attention grabbing. But there's also a very intuitive claim, which is that there's minute invisible substances that do act on people. And that we have this sort of magical or you know, precaution uh, psychology inside our minds. So that makes this sort of cultural story are uh, very, very successful. Now, in order to offend the maximum number of people, I wanted to talk about psychoanalysis as the same kind of thing. It's most successful, it's very successful, but a successful what? Uh, it's very difficult to say. It's not really a therapy because most people aren't cured of anything if they had anything to, work to, to start with. It's not really a cult, although it's kind of a cult, but it's not really a cult. We don't know, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that it's kind of shamanism. We have shame, you know, others have shamanism. We used to have uh, psychoanalysis, and it was very popular. There's elements of guru-like transmission in psychoanalysis, and you know, you all know the, that kind of stuff. There's absolutely no scientific testing or evidence for any of the claims, but those claims are very popular. And uh, as distinct, yeah, this is there's a sort of Lacan stuff, just in case you wanted some French stuff, here it is. But, you know, this is the theology of psychoanalysis. No one who does psychoanalysis actually knows that stuff. And I'm quite sure that everyone who knows that stuff has no idea what it means, but that's, that's okay. But people, the, the claims were very popular. And why are they popular? The claims are that um, we have, sorry, The claim, there's a sort of bait in this uh, theory, which is the counterintuitive claim that um, we have conscious deliberation is not driving behavior, okay? That is uh, what you think you want. You don't actually want it. There's some other bit of you that you're not aware of that wants things, okay? That's, that's very sort of counterintuitive and a bit, a bit sort of um, puzzling. And also that sex is pervading mental function. And you tend to think, well, yes, sure, but the reason I want to, 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 you know, to have more muffins is not, it's nothing to do with sex. Yes, it has to do with sex. So, uh, that's a bit sort of counterintuitive. But then there's the switch. There's the bait and switch. Because once you've uh, found those things very interesting, you're attracted and you realize that the entire system is very intuitive. It's very simple to understand. Because the homunculus that's inside your mind, that's called the unconscious in that theory, it's a little person. It's not at all like generative syntax, which is a little thing inside your mind, but no one has the foggiest idea how it works. And when you describe how it works, people say, what? Uh, no, it's a little person that wants things. It's a devious little agent that forces you to do things. Freud has immensely interesting passages where he says, well, the unconscious then realizes that he can't do it this way, that he does it the other way. And, you know, that's perfectly good for us. That's what we are evolved to process this kind of thing. So there's a combination of attention grabbing, counterintuitive potential uh, stuff, and inferentially rich, very easy sort of things. Um, this is where the homunculus is, actually. This is the unconscious, if you want to see it. OK, I've taken way too much time. So I will uh, move on to something I will not, I will not talk about. Um, religion, but I, I will just finish with this. In both cases, we have constraints. That is, uh, these culturally successful fads and fallacies, it, you can't explain them by generative principles. What I mean is that there is no logic in the mind that would predict that you will uh, create homeopathy or psychoanalysis or most religious ideologies. But you can have a selective 
uh, explanation, which is that once those things are around, they're very good for human minds because human minds find them both attractive, okay? The material attracts attention and it gets processed, but also it's minimally coherent so you can recall it. And also it triggers inferences. If you have an in unconscious in your mind that is trying to make you trip up and say obscene things to people, then you can predict what you should do and you, you, you know what's going to happen. And you can explain what happened in some cases. So this is a very sort of general sort of claim that I want to make about those uh, culturally creative things. Just like those nonsense ideologies or just like fiction, the, the, the best explanation for the fact that we have highly original, unpredictable phenomena there is that we have a rich psychology that is richly constrained by evolution, by natural selection, and is so rich and complex that it has scope for all these, for, it, it provides us with dispositions for all those uh, interesting sort of phenomena. And I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. I wonder if you could spend perhaps 30 seconds or a minute discussing the phenomenon of the pet rock. <laughs> perhaps you remember that product that someone invented, which was a rock in a box, which you could adopt and take care of in, in the light of the yeah. idea of playfulness. And, there's, and lots of, yeah, yeah, there's lots of ways in which we... Um, we have a powerful interest in um, creating person-like stuff out of uh, things that are not agents. And um, it, one of them, obviously, is the phenomenon of pets to core. You know, what pets are as, are animals treated as persons, that is, as individuals with you know, sort of preferences different from other individuals and so on. And I think it's one of those things. And some people do it with their computers. Um, it's possible uh, for humans to do that, but once again, once you've treated uh, a, an object as a quasi-person or an animal as a human-like person, uh, what you're doing is just transferring most of your implicit psychology of persons on those things, and you carry on. Uh, and from there, you can uh, predict lots of people's behavior. So yeah, I mean, I, I think there's hundreds of cases of these kinds of uh, phenomena. And once again, there's a kind of bait, which is that uh, a robot moves, but this thing doesn't even move. But you can have a relationship with it. You know? So there's something counterintuitive there. But once you've accepted that one, which makes it pretty attractive, um, why not uh, transfer all the assumptions you have about relationships, and then you're fine. Uh, it's, I think it's a very general sort of combination of uh, in, uh, uh, counterintuitive attention grabbing kind of material with very intuitive, very easy uh, inferences behind that. Yeah. Um, is it possible for you to show one of your slides again? Ooh. The one on causality, or is it too late? Did the ship uh, sail? But the, the one on causality just yes, said where that... where you had the nice string of arrows. Right. People assume that um, states of affairs cause perceptions which, in, which are among the things that cause beliefs, that are among the things that cause uh, in, intentions, that are among the things that, call, that cause action. Yes. And, and you pointed out that when the arrows point the other way, that then we get worried. Yes. But, well... It seemed to me that in religion, which you didn't get to, you want those arrows going the other way. It's your intention to believe, for example. And you have the notion of prayer, where you're, you're desperately trying to reverse those arrows. I wonder if you'd comment on that. Oh, yes, that's, very, that's a very good example, because that's a case where it's not judged to be uh, pathological. It's judged to be desirable, that uh, there are some circumstances in which we, you, you can say, well, if I have enough of the thoughts and intentions, I can actually create the belief. And um, it, it is a phenomenon, I, I must say, it's, it's interesting because it's um, something that seems to my mind to be more typical of um, sort of world religions 
than other religious systems. Um, in the sense that, you know, in most sort of tribal systems, so to speak, people have no, a sort of idea that there are ancestors and ghosts around. And, and ghosts, not goats, did I say goats? No, ghosts. There are goats around as well, but that's not a matter of uh, metaphysical belief. They, so, they, they, and then they have this sort of idea that, well, the notion of faith is pretty weird because, of course, these things are around. It's a bit like saying, I have faith in the existence of bricks. And you don't have to have faith for that, you know, they're around. In some world religions, you have this idea that if you have enough of the intention, you will get to the epistemic state, you'll have the belief. And that's an interesting case, yes, of, uh, and it's clear for people that that is not the same kind of belief as believing that there's a table here, because it's been, you know, through that uh, process. Thank you. Regarding... Um the function of uh, imaginary companions for mm -hmm. social training. I'm wondering if the same can be said for the writers of fiction, mm -hmm. because quite characteristically, they will say, I had to keep writing to find out what happened. Faulkner yeah. talked about his pen chasing his characters. Mm -hmm. um, um, the a uh, psychologist I was citing, Marjorie Taylor, who's done developmental studies on um, imaginary friends, um, has a book that's called Imaginary Friends and the Children Who Have Them. And in that book, she also talks about authors who, whose characters are like imaginary friends, and they have no idea what's going to happen next, and they want to find out what's happening next. So it's exactly what you're describing, and that's very much the case. Now, these are not your modernist writers, okay? You can't imagine uh, James Joyce saying, well, I have to carry on because I have no idea what Stephen will do. Uh, no, uh, it's, you know, it's a very different game. But the people who write sort of, uh, can I say, normal fiction, um, uh, they, they, they would say, yeah, that's the, that's the way it works. Uh, or, you know, I had this idea in my plot. That's another thing that some writers tell Marjorie Taylor. I had this idea in my plot that she would do this, but no, she won't. Uh, she, it's clear, uh, you know, she won't do that. Um, a, a good example of that is uh, Robert Musil wrote this um, uh, unfinished, but also unfinishable uh, novel, the, the Man Without Qualities, where the main heroes are brother and sister who, were, who are supposed in the plot. To, to commit incest. And, and somehow, and he wrote it in lots of fragments, and there's no end to the novel because actually he couldn't write that. Uh, so it never, it never ended. Um, so you have the, this case of a, a, um, a great sort of literary product that's the product of a failure because the imaginary, uh, what are they called, Ulrich and Agatha, they don't want to do it. And he wants them to do it because of some sort of mythical theme that he wants to put there, but they won't do it. Uh, so he just keeps writing stuff that is more and more sort of padding, as it were, which is wonderful, padding, but doesn't get the novel to where it's supposed to go. So, yeah, that's very, very true. Professor, I want to thank you very much for a very nice lecture here. Welcome. I have an interesting question about uh, people who produce uh, uh, aesthetic and uh, unusual things in our society, mm -hmm. such as creating music, creating writing, creating art, and uh, how they kind of fit in in their world. Mm -hmm. I happen to be one of those who has experienced this myself, and I remember an, as a very young child, until I was about eight years old, I thought everybody could draw. <laughs> and I thought, what a wonderful world. You know, we're all having fun. This is just amazing. And suddenly I realized, no, that's not so. But I've often wondered since, why is it that I can draw and so many other people can't draw? Or, you know, a friend who can produce music or a friend who can write well. Okay. I, um, I think you touched this soft underbelly of this whole sort of way of looking at things in the sense that it's uh, pretty, it's, you, can, you can approach using evolutionary tools, you can explain this, you, you can approach at least, not the, the sort of common 
uh, human experience. It's much more difficult to explain some of these dif differences and sort of idiosyncrasies. idiosyncrasies. So I I if you want the, the, um, an evolutionary theory or cognitive theory of culture is very good at explaining romance novels or pornography or things like that that are uh, so easily acquired by people, done by people. And, and we know from um, Paleolithic rock art that people did uh, pornographic graffiti, you know, 50,000 years ago. Oh, that's what they did, you know, just like what, that's what they do in uh, restrooms these days. So that is the kind of stuff that is pretty easy for that kind of theory. But then you have the emergence of the exceptional personality. And then I'm, I'm afraid uh, we don't have a good psychology of that, and we're nowhere near getting a good psychology of that. Uh, it's, I, I would be tempted to say, well, uh, maybe in 50 years someone will have some better grasp of that one question, uh, but I think we're nowhere near understanding it. We know some of the underlying stuff, you know, having better brain connections and having a brain that goes faster is probably very good. How could it not be good? Uh, but we don't have this sort of um, easy sort of, uh, we don't even know exactly what it is we would have to explain in order to make sense of those exceptional capacities. So. I'm afraid I have to say, you know, I cannot contribute anything to that, but I'm not too ashamed because neither can uh, <laughs> most people. So. That's perfectly okay. I, you know, it always was a wonder to me that even very primitive people doing cave drawings, they're better than I am in some of these. <laughs> That's an interesting, yeah, that is an interesting topic because actually, uh, you know what, we always see the good stuff, and what I showed you here was the super good stuff from Chauvet. There's a fascinating book by uh, Dale Guthrie, who's an um, archaeologist, about Paleolithic rock art. And he says that a lot of it has elementary mistakes that most beginners in drawing actually make. Uh, errors in perspective and things like that that you see in lots of, begin lots of beginners and that you see in rock art. But that rock art with all those mistakes is not the one you see in coffee table books because it doesn't look that great. Whereas what we see is the really wonderful horses from Chauvet or, you know, the Altamira. And, yeah, these were pretty good. Uh, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, as a follow-up on that question, um, we go, for example, in, in art from French academic to New York abstract expressionism. So where is the interaction between creativity and the environment? How do you bring that into the whole context? Again, that is the, the, the one um, theme that I was not even trying to, to approach because that's something that's by its very nature is outside the domain of the kind of evolutionary uh, cognitive explanation I'm talking about. There are historical trends that are historically uh, determined but are biologically contingent. You know, it could have been otherwise. It just happens that certain schools are around there and only an historian could tell you where the causation is there. What we can say um, from the kind of anthropological or perspective that I was uh, presenting here is that certain types, we can predict that certain types of objects or sort of um, aesthetic uh, schools and trends will be more easily accepted, more easily diffused than others. Okay, but that's a very general claim. As to the sort of historical specificity, at this point, you know, people created impressionism. Um, that is something that is historical in nature and is therefore outside the scope of this kind of model. You know, we cannot, I cannot explain it in those terms. So isn't it a very limited model, what you're talking about? It doesn't explain probably... 70% of everything, what ratio would you give to? Yes, it only explains 100%. <laughs> and um, when, when you look at a specific historical phenomenon, no, it doesn't say why that one was there at that point with those features. But what it explains is what features it probably has in common with uh, many, many others. So yes, it looks at the 100% sort of perspective. Um, 
Firstly, I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, and secondly, I wanted to ask you how satisfied you are with um, the, the two uh, main sort of offerings of accounting for evolutionary creativity, which in, I think I'm right in saying that they were byproduct theory and training. Yeah. And so, because it seems to me that the way that you laid out the problem um, was not necessarily, uh, you know, sort of addressed, uh, for me, satisfactorily by either of those things. Mm. And particularly with the training thing, I'm going to also, I mean, the imaginary friend thing, I think, is really um, an interesting phenomenon. And I was thinking, rather than thinking that, you know, people with imaginary friends get trained into better social right. relationships. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that research, because couldn't you also argue that um, people who have imaginary friends are already incredibly sophisticated yes. and need, yes. yeah. and, and the same with fiction writers. I mean, my That's sense right. is that fiction writers are already a, sort of mm -hmm. really interested in problems of human interaction, and therefore this is one of the ways in which this gets expressed. So there's a causality thing there. Mm -hmm. And also I just wanted to... I mean, it's, a, it's quite similar to the earlier question about people who read good literature have, you know, have better social skills. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering about whether um, people who have particular kinds of cultural capital, to use you know, Pierre Bourdieu's um, mm. term, are also attracted to particular kinds of high literature because it satisfies mm -hmm. um, their understanding of the world. So to think about both of those things in a slightly reversed okay. way. Okay. Um. Yes, I mean, in terms of imaginary companions, you're entirely right, and it's, um, it's, um, but it's an empirical question. So um, I, you know, I will refer you to the book by Marjorie Taylor again that uh, examines that and provides some evidence that, um, yes, you have to have the, 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 the sort of perception that you need training, as it were. Um, but I think she makes a good case for the fact that uh, it becomes a kind of a treadmill for the social intelligence. But you know, it's, it's all empirical data. Um, for highbrow literature, yes, I was trying to be facetious. And I, 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 anyone who spent time in an English department knows that uh, reading lots of great books doesn't guarantee great social intelligence or kindness. Or, you know, the milk of human kindness is in very short supply in those places very often. Um, but I would say that, it, again, it's an all else being equal kind of claim. That, and there you're probably right, that there are people who uh, feel enough need for information about social situations that they find literature, uh, fiction in literature, appealing, then there are people who have so much of it that they realize that the plot of romance novels is always the same. So they switch to something else if they'd ever you know, done that. Um, and then they realize that um, you know, Jane Austen is a bit predictable too, so we'll move on to Proust and Henry James, and how that, the, you know, that leads you even to... I don't, I don't want to deny that there are any sort of social capital you know, uh, effects there. Of course, they're massive in the transmission of those things. But all else being equal, I would say that um, it seems to me that, uh, yes, an interest in lots of different social situations might be both an index and a cause of a certain skill in understanding social situations. Um, I'm trying to defend the humanities. So, you know. <laughs> I was curious about your comment about homeopathy, because if you look at the idea of the law of similarity and the law of dilution, yeah. how do you distinguish homeopathy from vaccination? Mm. I don't. I think uh, the idea of uh, vaccination as a pure ideology, for example, uh, would be one that can work very well like that, too. Yeah. Uh, that's, um, it's interesting, actually, that uh, there's lots of... Uh, uh, spontaneous sort of um, rejection of vaccination that's um, based precisely on the idea that, uh, sorry, on the idea, on this phenomenon that when you describe vaccination, you're, exa you're describing exactly what people have in their minds about infection. You tell them, we'll give you a tiny dose, it's invisible, uh, you know, and immediately in their minds there's this sort of idea that my minute amount, that means great power. 
So yes, it's the same sort of uh, mental thing, mental phenomena that could make both equally successful as ideologies. I'm not comparing them in terms of scientific validation, because of course there they're completely different. But yeah, I mean it's, um, you know, there's a whole uh, field of uh, what people make of science uh, that is just waiting to be explored by anthropologists. It is a bit, but not enough. Uh, you know, how do these things get translated into people's intuitive uh, assumptions? That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Hi, thank you. And I want, I missed the last picture. I would like to know more about that, if I could. What was the last picture? picture you I think. Fads and fallacies. Oh, there was a picture of a brain with the no, not homunculus the picture, in it. But the um, image, the projecting, you know, the. The slide, yeah, that's the word. Uh, the whole thing, I just missed it, and I was wondering if you could tell me. Um, <laughs> I, I switched I off interested. the machine, but I, I, I uh, do you remember what that was? No, he didn't, no, he, he was sleeping all the time. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I was just fixated on the fact that the humanities have a role still. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was so surprising that you, you had to. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know which slide you're referring to. The fads, and, it said fads and fallacies, but I missed the rest, so I was wondering. Oh, yes, there was a beautiful picture that. of some fellow uh, looking into a glass, uh, uh, glass ball and uh, being in some kind of trance. I have no idea where that picture comes from. I tell you, it, can, it, it comes from Google Images. And I don't know what it is, uh, because like most people, I, I become a sort of peddler of information that I get on the internet and I recycle by giving it to other people. Uh, but um, I can try and source it <laughs> at some oh, point, okay. if you will. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, what are the evolutionary uh, benefits of such things, neurological states as trans states or yeah. spiritual, uh, spiritual feelings and such? I don't know if there are any. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something where, um, you know, these days lots of people want to say that there's lots of religious uh, stuff that is evolutionarily uh, constrained because it's very useful for this, that, or the other. In general, they focus on religious morality and saying that it makes us pro-social and things like that. I think that's not true, but that's one possible explanation. But uh, people rarely focus on those exceptional states, the sort of William James kind of states where you know, people have visions, they have trance and stuff like that, simply because um, it's quite clear that those things are not just exceptional in their occurrence, but that the capacity to have them is pretty exceptional. So people are in that situation of saying, well, it's very difficult to say that a disposition that doesn't occur so often um, may have an evolutionary, um, it may bring evolutionary advantages. So most evolutionists would say, well, it's probably one of those byproducts of having a brain organized in a particular way that you're sensitive to certain things. There's a very interesting um, set of studies that show that people have extremely sort of mystical experiences when they're in high altitude. And that above sort of 6,000 meters, as it were, uh, you definitely sense that there's someone around. Uh, and often it's someone who's actually sort of stopping you from doing what you should do so that you don't sort of climb on, you know, you don't sort of... Yeah, anyway, there's, um, again, since we're in the age where you don't need people like me, you only need Google, uh, what you can do is Google um, high altitude mystical experience. And there's a whole bunch of research on that, which is quite interesting. But again, it tends to say, well, you know, having very low oxygen supply is not the sort of thing we evolved to, to have. So, yeah, um, you know, it does occur, but we don't know if it has any, if it brings any advantages. Hi, um, I'm interested in hear what you would um, discuss, because you didn't um, touch upon it much of our sort of what's known of our um, neurobiology mm -hmm. from cognitive science and specifically things like our um, right brain, left brain mm. functioning, and when we have this, um, just you know, understanding that we've got <clears throat> capacities supposedly in our right brain of more things like a alternate uh, um, modes of uh, perception and states of being, 
um, in attention with our right, uh, my left brain sort of practical, let's survive kind of thinking. And in its contribution to things that you've discussed of um, creativity and culture and adaptation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure um, there's enough evidence to, um, to say that um, altered status of consciousness um, have any function that could relate them to, um, to survival and reproductive advantages. That's well, one then I'll just that. go back to um, Sorry? altered, instead of altered states of consciousness, concentrating on that, just all of what's encompassed in what we understand as of our right-brained kind of um, functioning. Yes, but the, the, the point is, you know, can we, um, when we're trying to find evolutionary um, origins to various sort of human behaviors or phenomena. What we have to, to, to keep in mind is that the only currency that works there is fitness, that is reproductive advantage. That is, our minds are not designed to understand the world better. They are designed to have more children. Um, and we are the descendants of the people, not the people who understood the world better, but the people who had more children. Well, so to the extent... Sorry. Oh, I'm no, sorry. Um, so to the extent that our minds um, sort of expanded to have a sort of richer view of the world, um, the, what we have to ask in, in evolutionary terms is to what extent the imperative of outbreeding other people uh, uh, brought about these kind of capacities. Now, in some cases, it's pretty obvious. Um, if you have the kind of attractiveness uh, psychology that most of us have, you, you have no sexual interest in telephones and chairs and stuff like that, but you have a lot in other members of, this, of the species. And that seems pretty obvious that you know, the more you're focused on, on that, the, the better. But um, for things like having high social intelligence, again, it, again it's, it's, it, it, there's um, a plausible claim that you can um, investigate empirically by, showing, by trying to see you know, what is the... Uh, success in terms of survival and reproduction of people who understand the others better, slightly better than other people. But for exceptional sort of um, uh, states and you know things like that, it seems to be vastly more difficult to see any connection to those things. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing that, um, for instance, comes to mind. Maybe a specific example helps you. Um, Alice Gopnik. Uh, um, uh, develop, child developmental mm. psychologist and philosopher speaks about the role of, as you spoke, of children in their imaginative play um, actually being a, a completely um, per, uh, pertinent to development of counterfactual thinking, which, though this might be a right-brained activity as they develop in their imaginative play, um, directly contributes to fitness because as you're able to um, develop counterfactual thinking, you're able to problem solve and better perceive what possible futures you could have and choose among them. So there's a case where right brain thinking directly contributes to um, mm -hmm. practical, um, you know, to do matters of fitness. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there's going to be lots of possible links. The, the problem is to test them so that we, we see that they actually bring about some advantage of that kind. That's all I was trying to say. One final question. Yeah. Excuse me. <clears throat> One of my fascinations is language and the way in which language and the learning of language perhaps affects the development of our brains. Mm -hmm. And the question that I was thinking about when you were talking about creativity and talked about fiction, about imaginary situations, talking to imaginary imaginary friends <clears throat> is to if we could imagine that we never developed language if we never developed, if we never developed in, in our evolutionary no. cycle developed the capacity for language for mm. the abstraction that lang the capacity of language gives us what, would we still have produced music would we still have produced yeah. cave paintings and other non-verbal types of creative acts? Or, is that, or are those also somehow a product of language? It's, it's a very profound and difficult question. The, the, 
domain specific view tends to suggest all the time that you could develop whatever you want in a, s in a small corner of the brain, but the rest doesn't matter. Um, now, it's also true. Um, it's also true that in terms of pathology, there are lots of domain-specific pathologies. So you will have people who are totally amusical or even worse, you know, aphasic uh, speak, but still have uh, all sorts of other capacities. So that kind of evidence would go towards saying, well, no, we have a whole panoply or collection of different capacities, and they each develop in their own way, and they're not really very much affected by each other. But that's only true about individuals and pathologies that we see uh, today, but what about the evolution of those things and to what extent did one scaffold the environment for the other? That's a very important question and I don't think we have um, enough of the theoretical tools to, 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 to analyze that. There are some archaeologists or paleontologists or, who are um, talking about that sort of, for example, looking at the, the, the presumed beginnings of proto-language in humans and seeing to what extent that would affect tool making by making some kinds of recursive operations in tool making easier because they're already present in syntax. This is pretty speculative, uh, but that exactly is the, the kind of um, thing you're talking about and there's probably lots of links of that kind that we could explore now. Please join me in thanking Professor Boyer.